Today we have a wonderful guest. Uh, as you know, every so often we talk to a person who's spent a good deal of their life doing good. And today is no exception. Our guest is Vice Provost Christine Littleton, She's Vice Provost at UCLA of Diversity and Faculty Development. Development. I was going to say recruitment, retention, but that's all development. <laughs> um, so welcome, Chris. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you so much for being here. Um, well, I do want to talk to you later in the show about all of the incredible stuff that's been <laughs> happening because, uh, as the audience may not know, Chris is a longtime legal scholar and activist, a law professor at UCLA for years, <laughs> many, many years, uh, head of the Women's <laughs> Studies Department at UCLA, um, a lot of wonderful stuff in your career. So I think since it's been such an extraordinary year for the community in terms of our legal stuff, I want to talk about that, but first I want to talk about you. <laughs> That's all right. Always happy to talk about me. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start at the beginning. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Pennsylvania in a series of small towns, mostly a rural. A series of small towns? Yeah, my father for uh, much of the time I was growing up was a Methodist minister. And uh, they like to move you around every couple of years so you don't get too uh, cozy with the, the local sinners. <laughs> but, but still, that must get kind of, uh, it's uprooting to a kid. It was, it was disruptive, uh, I, I have to admit. I, although one thing that was really good about it was I learned to make friends quickly because uh -huh. I had to. <laughs> I sure. didn't know how long we were going to be there. Um, and certainly there was, you know, there was a lot of change and turnover. Um, so there were, you know, like most childhoods, there are pluses and minuses. Siblings? Yes, I was the oldest of four. Uh -huh. uh, I had a, two younger brothers and then, uh, then there's a gap and then a sister. So what was your childhood like? Well, before, let's see, I was, we were in Danville for the first six years of my life. Um, that was a pretty quiet time. I walked, to, I could walk to school. It was only a block and a half away. Uh, it was a, you know, it was a city, it had a famous hospital, mm -hmm. Geisinger Hospital. In fact, I remember um, the first time that they made oral polio vaccine available. Hmm. Uh, we went up to Geisinger and drank the little cups, you know. Oh, I remember. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That was a long time ago. It's the first time we heard the name Jonas Salk. And, That's you know, right. I don't know who the heck right. he was, but he'd done something. He'd done something pretty wonderful. Um, but, uh, but the town itself was, you know, mod very modest size, old railroad town. And, uh, you know, so it was a, it, that was a fairly quiet life until my father decided that he was, had heard the call and decided and, and had to go to, wanted to go to seminary. And from then on, it was, a, it was kind of a roller coaster. Hmm. And so uh, did your mom work? Um, not until after my father left the ministry. She uh -huh. was, uh, she's, before, they, before, they, before they were married, she was uh, an accountant. Uh, and she had a great head for numbers. Uh, thank goodness, because uh, once my father became a minister, <laughs> you, you, had, you, you had to add, subtract, divide, and multiply that little tiny paycheck a lot of ways <laughs> to I raise four kids. So uh, you spent a lot of your life working on issues related to justice. I mean, even just going to law school, although it doesn't guarantee that a person is interested <laughs> in justice, um, but certainly that's the way it turned out for you. Did something trigger that early on? I think a, a lot of things. Um, interestingly enough, when I was younger, um, I wanted to be a lawyer, but I was, con I was convinced that women couldn't be lawyers. I didn't know any lawyers. On television, all you saw was, you know, Perry Mason. <laughs> right. um, I wanted to be Perry Mason. And everybody said, well, you can be Della Street. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, uh, you know, the kind of towns that I grew up in, you know, in the, uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, it really was a question of, well, you're, you know, you're a smart kid, girl. You could be a teacher or you could be a nurse. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I picked teacher. That's a much easier job. Right? Uh, so you became a teacher? I did. Um, I went to, uh, got through college. It took me, it took me a while to get through college. I, I kept running out of money. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's happening to people <laughs> today, too. Exactly. I mean, at that point, it was a lot cheaper. I went to a very small state school, um, Shippensburg State College. I started there in Shippensburg, Pennsylvania. Um, and so it was, 
very inexpensive at the time, but more than more than I expected. And I was so naive. I, um, you know, we didn't know about taking loans for college mm -hmm. or how to get financial aid. I I can't figure out why didn't we know this stuff, right? <laughs> so you'd stop and <laughs> so work I stopped and, and went to work save for some a year. money and then go back. That's right. And fortunately, the second the, about the uh, the second time it happened, um, very nice woman, you know, in the financial aid office said, "What have you been living on the yeah. last couple of years?" And I said, "Well, you know, I've been working and save my money and I spend it, and then I working I was working mid midnight to eight shift at the uh, at an alarm company, you know, monitoring <laughs> the alarms and the security stuff, which was great because I could do my homework while I was there of and course. then." Stay up, go to class, and then go home. And then, then crash. Um, as long as you didn't fall asleep, it was a great job. But uh, she <laughs> said, she, you know, she said, uh, we can give you money. I said, you can. It was I know, just like it's amazing. This big revelation to me These that people were willing to lives. exactly right. People were actually willing to help you get through. So with you, to sort of intermittently finishing you know your <laughs> degree did you still did you think you were going to law school absolutely not um, mm. I ended up at Penn State no I I, um, I I majored in theater for most of the time I was in college although I kept changing around I finally ended up with a, a degree in education uh-huh the one, the one thing I didn't expect um, going from theater through communications um, to education and um, it was <laughs> it was quite a ride, but I guess. <laughs> and in fact, at one point, I know I was. I think I was in my junior year. No, I was. In, I must have been getting close. I must have been like a semester or two away from from getting through finally. So um, so I went to the pre law advisor and I said, you know, I think I might like to go to law school. And she said, oh no, you have to take all these other courses. And I said, well, how long will it take me? And she said, well, you know, another year of college. Mm. I said, I can't afford that, so forget about it. Now, it turns out that's not true, right? It you can go to law virtually... school with any old degree. Right, exactly. <laughs> I, I, so I, I can't figure out whether she thought I was asking a different question mm -hmm. and answered that or question. Or just wanted to discourage you. Could be. I Who mean, knows? maybe she thought I was a flake, right? Or the theater major. <laughs> so, um, aren't, I, I weren't know, we all flakes? <laughs> I know now you're in a relationship, long term relationship with a woman. That's right. But you were married before. Were oh, yeah. Not? And was that at this time while you were in college? or? Um, I met my former husband in college. We were both in theater. Um, and and then we moved to um, to New Haven. He got an, he got a, uh, an MFA at Yale in theater engineering. Apparently Yale was the only place in the country that had that <laughs> program in theater engineering, so he designed uh, lighting and sound equipment. Um, and then moved to New York and he was working at CBGB's. You, you, do you remember the punk rock days? Of, uh, I, yeah. Most people don't quite remember them, but you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> and so we, uh, we were in New York for a couple of years and that's where I, I, so I taught high school while we were, while we were in New Haven, um, a place called Guilford. Mm -hmm. Taught English speech and theater uh, for three years, and um, you know that really was enough of the public high school public school experience. Uh, I really liked teaching, but I didn't like the the part that went around it. You know, sort of the being the being the combination disciplinarian and you know social engineer, um, trying to teach manners and deal with, and frankly, deal with um, people who didn't respect teachers very much. Mm -hmm. um, since we didn't make much money, we must not be worthy of respect. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and there was a real emphasis on um, sort of, you know, playing it, playing it safe, not mm -hmm. innovating. I have to tell you a story about this. I had this one class. This was this was such a sweet class. There was a scheduling mistake, so I wound up instead of having 40 students in remedial reading, I had um, something like 13, which was great because I could actually pay attention to each one of them. Um, and so I instituted this this plan that 
when they reached a certain reading, these are these are kids who had you know, were like two, three, four years behind behind grade level in reading, and supposedly behavior problems. I mm -hmm. mean, so I instituted this plan that if they if they got up a certain a certain number of levels in their reading program, that I would bake them a cake. <laughs> and nothing happened until the first kid got to that level and got a cake took it down to the lunchroom and shared it with her friends. You know, the first time she'd ever like been able to brag about an academic success, sure. right? About a school success. Boy, from then on, those kids were in there. They were in there during the, their study periods. They were in my, <laughs> in my, in the reading lab, you know, after school, first thing in the morning, they were coming in, can I come in now and, and do my reading? It was fabulous. And by the end of the year, all, you know, almost, Let's see, I think it was, um, there were only two who didn't get um, tested out of the special section. Well, of the it sounds section. like you were very successful as a teacher, but you oh, yeah. didn't want to do it as a career. Well, the, I, got, I got in trouble with the principal because um, the students are supposed to like learning for, their, for its own sake, not so oh, they not can brag cakes. to their friends. <laughs> not for cakes, right? <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> what else? They've uh. never had any success. Why not celebrate it? But so that's part of the the part around the teaching. The actual teaching was terrific, but um, but it's difficult to get to that. And I think you know in today's society with the with all the the scrutiny on teachers, the slamming of teachers, blaming teachers for what's wrong. Well, with, and the testing, you and know, the, the whole testing thing has gotten way out of hand, and so it's even worse now. It's even harder to actually get to the teaching. So I guess when we get to you being a law professor, we'll talk about how that's actually different. But I'm interested because it didn't seem like law school was in your future. Not at all. How'd you get there? See, now here's another thing of people help, amazing people like helping me when I didn't expect any help. Um, I got it, I, I learned how to type in one of these, one of these high schools that um, we'd moved around in. Um, Cause I figured, you know, you could. You can always use that skill, right? And uh, especially now, who knew? <laughs> we didn't have computers then, and now we're really glad we know how to do that's it. Right, that's Texting. right. Texting. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Well, no, no, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but, but I knew how to type. So, um, so when we moved to New York, um, I looked for the first thing I could find while I was doing, I was doing some off-off Broadway theater, which does not pay. <laughs> I think I've made all of like a total of a hundred dollars in my entire acting career, uh, yeah, <laughs> but a lot of free food, which sometimes came in handy. Um, but so I so I wanted I needed a day job. Um, the first job I got was was at the Legal Aid Society uh, wow. in downtown New York, right ac right across from the courthouse in Foley Square, and uh, so I was working. F I was I got hired into the special special litigation unit which did really interesting work I mean one of the one of the big cases um, was uh, had to do with rap sheets and which is your criminal record and there were so many inaccuracies in the rap sheets that folks who had been acquitted of crimes were not able to get work because the rap sheet showed they'd been convicted mm. and, and so people weren't hiring them and you know, they were they hadn't they hadn't been found guilty of anything, um, and another case, and then so the lawyers let me actually get more into the substance of the work. They took me to court with them. So it wasn't um, just interviewing people to testify, which is usually what you get when you're and or or, and, or typing or typing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was hired just as a typist, right. right? But I soon started doing more stuff. In, in fact, um, I helped them with a uh, I helped do a. Uh, a study of the jury pool in New York at that time and particularly we were looking because it seemed to be very light on Latinos or mm -hmm. Hispanics um, mostly in, in New York at that time it would have been Puerto Rican and Cuban mm -hmm. um, Americans and in fact we so we did this whole analysis of the jury pool and I testified mm -hmm. about how we'd done the analysis uh, boy I was hooked yeah you know, this was this was fabulous but remember I thought you had to have you know, you those had to have classes those classes that you had taken, right? And you had to have, you know, you had to be brilliant, and you had to have a fabulous GPA. And you were GPA a woman. And I mean, yeah. Well, well, there there was a woman lawyer in that unit, 
Uh -huh. The first one I ever well, that's met. That's inspirational. That was, that was incredibly inspirational. So, so I, I met a woman lawyer. I saw women lawyers in the courtroom. Um, hadn't seen any on the bench yet, but mm -hmm. I, I, you know, you can't really, you can't really aspire to something that you don't know exists for you. Right. And so I think I think the role modeling is really important. It was very important for me to know and to see women lawyers in action. Um, but then and then the lawyers there encouraged me, um, and. Well, I decided, well, you know, I could at least take that test that they give. That, right? that LSAT <laughs> test. I could at least give it a try and see. Um, so I did. And it was... Uh, Must have turned out okay because... <laughs> <laughs> you laugh. I happen you know. to know where you went to law school. <laughs> yeah, we both went to the same place. Yes, we did. And we're both proud of going to Harvard. <laughs> I think it's quite... And for me, it felt like a major, like, how did I get here? Did I, you feel that way too? Well, shoot, when I, where I grew up, Harvard, that was like Camelot, right? I wasn't even sure that it existed for real. And, right. My parents you know. really didn't understand at all when I got in. It was my mother said, Well, but honey, can't you keep your good job and stay in LA? <laughs> you know, and she meant it in the very yes. best way. Oh, you know, absolutely. I mean it was kind of like outcome so completely off the charts. That's right. I mean the first thing since we were living in New York, the, you know, and, and I was still married, first thing my, my mother said when she found out that I got admitted to Harvard was but what will what will John do? What will your husband do? I said, well, he'll, he's going to come with me. I think <laughs> you know, he could, there are jobs in in Boston too. It's a big town. Um, but of course, you know, we'd never been to any place like that. So. Right. Um, and it was and it was funny. And then and then I uh, I wrote on to the law review at Harvard. I, I was both on the Women's Law Journal and on the law review. And I remember. <laughs> That's another great story. But when I ran onto the law review, my mother said, Honey, I can tell from your voice that this is something really good, mm. but could you tell me what it is? <laughs> well, even the phrase writing on, I don't think that most of the people watching really, oh, really right. know. Do you get to be on the law review at a law school in different ways? I mean, are, are some people automatically get on, and then other people have to write in order to be chosen? Yeah. At, I, I mean, some places have have everybody has to has to pass a writing t you know a writing competition, mm -hmm. and other places have some people get on by having stellar grades. Uh -huh. Well, you know, I did not have stellar grades my first year in law school. Um, I couldn't figure out what they were what they were looking for. I was having a great time <laughs> in class. I was so into it. I thought it was really interesting, and I, you know, I was. And I was raising my hand and I was talking and then, you know, having a wonderful time and arguing with everybody, you know, afterwards we'd, we'd make these little arguments. And then I get to the exam and I look at the question and I think, what in the world is he asking me? <laughs> me and they too. were all he's. Right? Although fortunately, when I went to college, B was a fabulous grade because it was during Sputnik. And so they didn't give A's very much at the undergraduate level. So when I was at Harvard, and you know, B is like a failing grade. Everybody gets A's or B's, really, <laughs> at the law school. And so when I brought my grades home, my parents were so proud of me oh. because I'd gotten B's, which everybody thought was a oh, fabulous God. grade. So I did not disabuse them, you know, of the <laughs> fact because I was happy that I even kind of, you know, made it through. It seemed like such a an environment I could never compete in. Well, did you? It, and did you feel like a sort of like an alien who'd been transplanted to this? Strange well, don't place forget, People way? Magazine was always writing about me. Ah, because right. Because my character, Zelda Gilroy, in the Dobie Gillis <laughs> show, People Magazine would always go, Zelda goes to law school. So suddenly, <laughs> I am very different from everybody at this place. And, and they're um, all watching you to see how, <laughs> how right. are you going to react. And it, I was older, too. I was 34 right. before I went to law school. I was a feminist, which you know, was just a very new thing and not everybody was. Oh yeah. Oh, so what yeah. was your experience like there? You were clearly very successful by the end. Yeah. In fact, it was very interesting. My grades went up every semester. Once I figured out what the heck they wanted, oh, I could do that, right? Why didn't somebody tell me what it was that they were, we were supposed to be like doing? We've always stumbled into <laughs> these things, Chris. Because yes. you you didn't want to be a law professor when you were there. I I uh, no. No, I I wanted to be Perry Mason in drag, right? Or not in drag, right? <laughs> he was sometimes in drag as well. It's all right. We, you know, but Mason boy, I wanted. Piece. That's what I wanted. In fact, 
you know, when I was at the, while I was at the Lay, Lay Society, I saw um, accused prostitutes brought in from the jail cells. They, you know, they do a roundup at night. They bring them in, make them sleep on, you know, in these crowded uh, cells, and then bring them into court in chains, mm -hmm. not just not just handcuffs, chained together. And these folks hadn't been convicted of anything, right? Mm -hmm. They hadn't even yet been had their had their like day in court. Mm -hmm. But they were chained, and I thought, okay, none of that. That's not going to happen anymore. I'm going to law school. I'm going to fix this. Right? You know? so, so that was my attitude in first first year of law school. Boy, it was so. It was just so interesting to see. Um, you know, to see that. I remember one time in in uh, administrative law. Um, you know, the, we're we're talking about the food stamp program, and you know, and, and how it works, and. You know, I have all these students are popping off about what they think about people who get food stamps and what they're like. And I raised my hand. I said, well, when my family was on food stamps, and everybody goes, oh. A hush. <laughs> a <laughs> hush comes <laughs> over the room. Right. <laughs> I thought, well, you know, sometimes people need. I mean, my father lost his job at one point. He was out of work for a while. We were on food stamps. What are you mm -hmm. going to do? Mm -hmm. And uh, But at least I knew what people who were on food stamps thought. I wasn't trying to guess from the perspective of folks who were summering in the hands. Well, you also were, you said you were involved in the Women's Law Journal. So yeah. something about the condition of women in society had gotten to you somehow because, you know, it often isn't just about us. I mean, I was also a feminist in law school, um, although it was my class that started the Women's Law Journal. That's I mean, right. Three women <laughs> in my class. What, and, what I loved about the way you started it, too, was you had the, the the way this started was you had a, a celebration of a right. certain you know women had been finally admitted to Harvard like only twenty five twenty five years, years before, before that, that date right and and so it was a celebratory magazine uh, issue and then you called it Volume One <laughs> well we we had yes. a meeting it was just supposed to be a little book for the celebration uh -huh. where we were going to invite scholars to write about you know women's mm -hmm. condition in the law and. Um, we uh, we were in a room in one of the buildings at the law school and had to decide what to call it. Mm -hmm. And I literally, my only contribution <laughs> to the Women's Law Journal was walking to the board and writing, how about Harvard Women's Law Journal, volume one, number one? And it's still going. Oh, but, yeah. You know, we didn't know at the time. What but it was 20, extraordinary. 20 odd years later, oh, maybe 30, they're yeah. publishing every year. Right. And I was the managing editor of volumes four and, uh, four and five. Right. And so you were my hero before I met you, <laughs> right? Okay, we have to stop this and get back to your story. <laughs> it, is, it is fun. But it's interesting to me, you did not think you would be a law professor. Now, are you still married? Did the husband indeed follow you to... He followed me, and then we uh, we split during the during the first year of law school. Second, you know, pretty soon, no, about during early in my second year of law school. Well, law school is a pressure cooker. Oh yeah. If there's any strain, it splits. This was also a time when people were being more open about their sexuality. That's right. And frankly, more exploring. I mean, it had really been in the '70s, and you were there in the '80s, right? Uh. Yeah, so, well, early, early 80s. Early 80s, I right. started in 79, and 79, so 82. Was this something you were going through, too? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I had always been um, different. <laughs> I'm not going to let you get along with that. I get away with that. Do you uh, mean Q of the LGBTQ variety? Q, or Q, Q and, yes. I, I, I often describe myself as not straight. Mm -hmm. But there never were any. There, there weren't that many categories. If you uh, right, you either had to be straight or gay. That's right. When in, and in fact, I remember at one point, you know, not too long after law school, um, you know, ha being uh, having anonymous HIV testing, and they asked me, you know, um, are you gay, straight, or bi? And I said, are those the only categories you have? <laughs> Well, it would be sort of difficult to think about what else there was at that point. Inadvertently celibate. I, there were so, but now <laughs> my students are like a, a complex of uh -huh. a galaxy of different kinds of different ideas about their sexual identities, their sexual orientation, their sexual practices. Those things don't always line up. 
Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, I, when I think about the relationships, I, the, the very important relationships in my life, you know, um, one was with a straight man. Uh, being married was not the most, being married was, a, was an interesting experience. I'm glad I had it. I'm also glad I don't have it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, a gay man um, who was a very, very important part of my life and is, in fact still is. I think he talked about it on the on your show once. Uh, right, John Davidson. And he's at now the, at Lambda. Right. Um, when we were together, he was developing his own um, ideas about his, himself and what he was going to be doing. He was um, he was then working at a, a law firm. Um, that's how we met. We were both working at the same law firm in Century City, and uh, he was a fabulous. He's still a fabulous lawyer. Probably the best lawyer I have ever ever known. And, and then uh, a lesbian. Uh, my current partner is... Uh, For a long and time I now, hope, right? Well, it's almost 15 years. And I, right. I hope this is... I say I've had you know, three really important relationships in my life. I hope this is the last one, but you never know. Well, you, it, you always seem very mysterious to us about it. But I think that <laughs> it, you really did not I mean, seriously want to be categorized. And I think that's... Yeah. In many ways, it's a kind of political statement, even if you don't think of it that way. I found it's it like, very frustrating. Yeah. I was looking for a label for me uh, for a long time. And in fact, and I was willing to adopt whatever anybody wanted, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, some, one of my friends said, oh yeah, you've always been out. We just never could figure out what you were out about. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> oh, yeah, so, I guess so. <laughs> so here you are not wanting to be a law professor, but I've known you only really as a law professor for Almost 20 years yeah, at this UCLA. Yeah, not my idea. <laughs> really? So who wanted to teach? I didn't want to teach? teach anymore. I mean, yeah. I, I didn't want to teach again. I wanted to go to court. Well, what happened was I, um, I came to Los Angeles to clerk for a federal judge, which was a wonderful experience. Um, and, uh, and while I was clerking, um, someone at, at a local law school had read a piece I'd written for the Harvard Women's, Harvard Law Review, um, and, and in those days we didn't sign them. They were supposed to be a group right. effort, right? right. And, but everybody knew who's, that was mine. And it was the only one indexed under feminist legal theory. Mm. Because <laughs> when we indexed the volumes, they said, well, where do you want it indexed? And I, I said, you know, you I gave said, them a I couple like things. Categories. And I said, I want <laughs> <laughs> and In fact, I said, I said, I want it indexed under federal uh, feminist legal theory. And they said, we don't have that category. And I said, well, make one. There'll be lots of them later. And in fact, that's true. There are lots right, of them later. Right. But at the time, there weren't any. So they made the category because I was such a pain in the, you know what, until they did and, and, and did it. Um, and somebody had read it and invited me to come in and talk to them. Um, and I said, no, no, you know, I'm, I'm really not interested in teaching. And I said, well, come have lunch, right? Free lunch, free food. You know, I grew up poor. You do not turn down a free meal, right? right? Fine. I had a fabulous time. I really, I mean, I liked the people were great. The, the intellectual conversations were great. And, and then, you know, they pulled a fast one on me. They said, oh, well, you can still practice. Right? <laughs> um, you know, you'll have time to do that and, and, you know, you can do what you they want. They really on wanted the you there, Chris, and and uh, and it'll be fun. Sure, um, I tried. I tried being a full-time law professor and practicing, and so it's fine if you don't want to sleep. Right, exactly. <laughs> so let's fast forward a little bit through it because I think uh, most people would understand what being a law professor is. Um, and I know you started teaching a class in the women's studies. What was it at the time? Program. It was a program. It was an undergraduate um, program. And ended up being the director of that <laughs> program at UCLA. This is all at UCLA. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been really lucky that way. I got to stay in the right. same, with the same employer, i.e. UCLA, on the same campus and change my job every couple of years. Well, let me ask you one thing because I really want to get to talking about the cases. Uh -huh. Because um, as you indicated, it's been an extraordinary year oh, wow. for the LGBT community in the courts. But one of the interesting juxtapositions, uh, as you brought the Women's Studies program uh, into being a department, which is a very big deal at a university, yes. and shepherded that 
beautifully and really, I think, brought it great respect. Um, you know, it's hard to say seriousness. I don't mean within, I mean without. Well, taken, it's, got, it's got some real stature. Seriously. I mean, women's studies at UCLA right. is seen nationally as, if not the uh, best, certainly one of the best in the, in the field. Um, we have a freestanding PhD. See, I'm still saying we. I, I was well, chair. Okay. I was the you chair of that department until two weeks ago, right? right. <laughs> um, so that that we have a freestanding PhD. Every single one of our the PhDs that we've granted, and we've grant, and it's only been around for ten years, but we've already turned out um, eleven PhDs, and every single one has gotten either a tenure track position, a regular teaching position, somewhere at, um, at a university or college, or a postdoc, which is uh, prestigious too, right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm really, I, I'm really, really proud of that. Well, the other thing I found interesting when we were talking um, was that there really was no place to locate a class about sexual orientation and the law, really, because there was no program yet at That's UCLA. Right. Things were new, and so you actually opened a space for that in the women's studies that's program. right the first uh, the first classes the first class that had the title introduction to lesbian gay bisexual and transgender studies was in women's studies mm -hmm. and in fact it was, I think it was first called introduction to lesbian and gay studies and then added mm -hmm. um, the uh, bisexual and transgender but we taught and we housed that course in women's studies for oh at least five maybe six years until a minor, an undergraduate minor in LGBT studies was started, and, we, and it's still cross-listed in both programs. Mm -hmm. um, women's studies has been the home for graduate work. If you want to do graduate work in sexual orientation, where do you do it? You do it in women's studies. Um, will our name always, will that name always stay women's studies? Probably not. Probably mm -hmm. sooner or later it'll switch to gender studies or mm -hmm. gender and gen women, gender and sexuality. I mean, those things are, in, you know, constantly the field keeps changing and growing. Um, but it's always been a very, very um, sexuality-oriented uh, department. Well, feminism and, and, is... And also very racially diverse and mm -hmm. socioeconomically diverse. Well, feminism, I always thought, was a, a much bigger deal than people made it because it's a sort of a transformational way of looking in our yeah. discipline for instance looking at the law um, the notion that experience counts the lo notion that stories are as much a part of the law as theories and that um, people are part of the law and what and happens was, to people right is really crucial you right the outcome the consequences right. not just you know, I'm applying the law like the law exists. That was amazing to me, going to law school. <laughs> I thought they were going to teach me the law only to find out that it didn't really exist. That we was are creating it, was it all argument. the time. We Even when there it. was law on the books, it, the whole thing was an argument about whether you actually did or did not cross this line or that line. <laughs> That's right. Speaking of which, let's talk, well, let's talk about these cases. Because people have, I mean, the law itself, has been a real battering ram for our community. Um, you mean like opening ask, doors when, when mm, we couldn't open them any other way? <laughs> yes, that's one thing. But I was also thinking of an assault, uh, uh -huh. making the law, don't ask, don't tell, uh, the Defense of Marriage Act, uh, even being left out of the law, such as marriage equality, or lack thereof. And think of how much damage was done by sodomy laws until so right. recently. I right. mean, you know, Lawrence versus Texas was only, what, six, seven years ago? Mm -hmm. I mean, until that time, states were perfectly free to make it, you know, illegal uh, to make love. Whoever, who came up with that concept? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, uh, it's just like Ursula K. Le Guin said, you know, same and different. Our nurturing words, our friendship words, can be happy words. The killing words are better and worse. 
which mm -hmm. is, in my opinion, all that categories have ever been about. Except it's not, words. are you different, but are you worse? Yeah. You know, yes. let me yes. get a reward and then you won't get it. Yeah. Marriage is really very much Can like that now. Can people be different and equal? That's, I mean, my scholarship was all about when I was, when I was uh, publishing and researching and publishing in this area, my scholarship was all about trying to break that link between difference and inequality. Um, I mean, Audre Lorde said, you know, can we, can we now treat each other as equals and different instead of having to be the same in order to be equal? I mean, okay, sameness and equality go together in mathematics, not in human beings. <laughs> well, the California case that was about the uh, benefits that the state of California was giving to its employees where for health care, men got all the health care they needed and mm -hmm. women got an equal thing, which was all, all the, the health care men, men needed. needed. <laughs> <laughs> right, which was, you know, and the Supreme Court said, fine. That's right. That's not sex discrimination because at any given time, many women are not pregnant. And therefore, it was not a division between men and women, but a division between pregnant Pregn and non-pregnant persons. Don't you love that? Now, the, remember, there were no women on the Supreme Court at the time they said. But there were men, women in Congress, and what <laughs> happened? Congress said, huh? And amended Title VII so that right. pregnancy discrimination was a form of discrimination. So you're right. The law has been in fact, a way of opening doors, yeah. certainly for women, but now, I think, for our community. I think so, too. I mean, after all, look, the, the, the Constitution doesn't say, you know, that, that this is a document for straight people. Um, it, it, did, it did at one point say it was a document for men. Um, and for men who held property, mm -hmm. but it's it says you know, and and particularly that great Fourteenth Amendment that has the Equal Protection Clause in it says you know it says no state shall deny to any person, any person, within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws, and I thought boy, I mean that's one of the things that really got to me. I, that statement got to me when I was in law school. I said, here's something I can believe in. Here's something that's really solid, and I believe in this, that you know, you've got to be able to all people, no matter, no matter who we are or how different or how similar we are, we have to be able to access this. And I think that's what happened 10 years ago when the, when the U.S. Supreme Court finally said in Romer versus Evans, look, you can't, you know, you can't say, okay, this group, i.e. gays and lesbians, they're not allowed to petition the government. Um, other groups, this was Colorado, right? right. The, um, one of their propositions said, you know, uh, no, the gays and lesbians can't, can't petition the government for any, any benefits, right? You can't, you can't pass any laws like that. We're not going to let you. We're just going to freeze things the way they are so that you're second-class citizens, and that's equal. And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that to any group. We don't care how much you dislike them. You just can't do that. Right? But it was a slow awakening over oh, the history yeah. of the United States in terms of a Supreme Court. Now, first, of course, a case has to be brought. And often a case is brought and kicked out and brought and kicked out and brought and kicked out mm -hmm. because it's just like with women where they said equal protection doesn't apply to women, uh, apply to women because they're not similarly situated to men and therefore you don't get into the 14th Amendment. That's right. <laughs> and then suddenly there's this awakening, which I think does relate to the history of what's going on in the country. It does. It a does. lot of voices are saying, wait a minute. There has to be, there has to be a serious um, political and social movement, and somewhat well organized, too, in order to move the courts to understand things differently. When, what you're doing is shifting. It's just like when you think about the difference between Plessy versus Ferguson and Brown versus, um, and the and the Brown cases that, Brown versus Board of Ed, you know this shift in thinking between it's okay as long as, you know, blacks and whites get to ride, in the same train even but if not they're in different the same car. cars, to oh, maybe it's not okay, mm -hmm. you know even if they're similar, and of course they never were similar, right? That it was always the case that, that the white schools were a lot richer and better and, you know, 
had no broken windows and had but see that was a, that was, but that was a real people moment that was when it. he when he brought the results of the experiment with the black dolls and the white dolls and showed that black children thought that the white dolls were beautiful and the black dolls were not and you had a real people harm That's right. From what segregated are you doing, schools, what are you even doing separate people? but equal. Even if in theory you both had the same thing, what are you doing to people when you teach them that they are not as good? So what's happening, I mean, this year alone, <laughs> it's almost like somebody <laughs> set off the fireworks and every week it's like... <laughs> oh, heck, it's, and, and, and in fact, this summer was amazing. This well, summer let's talk you had, about, the, tell us what happened, if you can, you, you know. You this can, summer you had three separate, just this summer alone. If you're not even talking about the year, just the summer alone, you had three different federal district courts taking, um, you know, ba basically taking pro-gay positions for and and finding um, in let's see, court in Mass district court in Massachusetts finding that uh, the the Defense of Marriage Act, which is the federal rule pro prohibiting us from getting married, that was unconstitutional finding that the don't ask, don't tell policy that the military uses to kick us out of the military, 13,000 soldiers with skills that we could use being kicked out because somebody found out. Like Arab interpreters. Uh, yeah, it would be helpful to have some. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Pashto speakers would be, not, would be very helpful. Um, and, um, and also, um, just <laughs> barely the... Uh, district court in California uh, finding that um, so the, the injunction against don't ask don't tell and uh, the court finding that prop 8 uh, which tried to which again was an attempt to keep us out of marriage just to keep us out of the Constitution is unconstitutional so there you go boom 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 they're all unconstitutional now not they are district court cases, right? So Which is the lowest federal court. That's the lowest federal court. But nonetheless, that's where you can find some room, some brave folks who say, yeah, we might have thought about, you know, marriage as not including same-sex marriage for a long time, but there's nothing really that in the Constitution that says you should do that, and there's nothing really in logic that says that, because after all, this is a federal, this is a, a government benefit, Get, you know, being able to marry, having that kind of protection for your kids, having that kind of protection to be able to get Social Security benefits, to be able to file joint taxes, to be able to visit your sixth partner in the hospital, those are benefits that the government gives in public hospitals. And, you know, so that's a, that's a, a, a governmental status. Now. There's a religious status that goes with it too, but that's not our issue, right? That's up to the churches. If you want to get, you know, of church weddings and whether it's a sacrament of marriage, that's a whole different thing than marriage as a civil right. And to have, a, have the courts recognizing that kind of thing. So if you look at, you know, in three different areas in non-discrimination per se, we've got it this year, you know, we've got the, the U.S. Supreme Court saying that the University of California's uh, law school in uh, San Francisco, Hastings, the Hastings Law School, which is part of the UC system, so it's a state school. This law school has a rule. Student organizations, if they want to use our name and they want to get money from us, uh, they have to take everybody. They can't discriminate on all these ba on any of these bases. You can't discriminate. You know, you can't can't have the the white students clubs and not let in the Asian Americans, and you can't have the uh, and you can't have the Christian Legal Society and not let in gay people. You know, and the Christian Legal Society said, wait a minute. We, you know, we want to teach that uh, relations, same-sex relations are sinful and awful. And, and how can we do that if there are gay people in the room? <laughs> um, well, you have managed to do it in front of me pretty well, but uh, that's another story. Right? <laughs> they don't seem to have any problems. For instance, right, right. right. Um, but um, they, so they wanted to say, you know, we can't admit uh, and still be able to have our identity. Well, of course you can. You just don't get the money from the taxpayers. You don't get public money. You could have 
your little, you can have your own little clique, but you can't get public money, you can't use the UC, you can't use the state's name to do that. Um, and the U.S. Supreme Court said that's right. They could, you can't, now the state can't force them to take people that, that they think right. don't it's fit their beliefs. Right, it's just that there are consequences that's in right. terms of doing something where you don't go get pick. the go public pick. benefits. You can do it privately, right? and we're not going to interfere with you, but if you try to do it publicly, this is a non-discrimination clause. It's applied equally. It doesn't say you can't have a particular belief. It just says you just got to, you know, whatever these people believe, if they want to be in the Christian law, legal society, they can be as long as they're used so to it seems people. like it's been really an extraordinary year. And it really, although we, we know and our audience knows, there's been an enormous amount of work that's been going on for, you know, decades. Oh. Bringing these cases, preparing the cases, arguing the cases, finding the witnesses, losing in some cases. Um, been a slow slog, but it seems like suddenly it's really come together. You know, you get a in critical terms mass. Of a, I don't know, uh, you know, a... You a, get a foothold. You right. get, you, you find an opening. And, and, and that's what lawyers do in a large sense. I mean, this is one of the reasons I'm so happy to be at UCLA, and particularly now dealing all the time with diversity. I, I mean, my full-time job is to encourage diversity, racial, religious, ethnic, um, gender equity, LGBT issues, uh, disability issues, all that stuff. But one of the reasons I'm so proud of, of UCLA is, you know, we have things like, UCLA is one of the top 20 um, in, the, in Campus Pride, right, because we have a fabulous resource center, uh, LGBT resource center, thanks to people like Ronnie Stanlow and Melissa Etheridge, who gave them money for right. a library. Um, and we have the Williams Institute on Sexual Orientation and Law. I mean, you said there weren't any places for sexual orientation issues. Now we have, we have courses regularly. The Williams Institute on Sexual Orientation and Law at the UCLA Law School has, thanks to people like Charles, uh, by Chuck, Chuck Williams, who gave, you know, gave the first set of money, and Brad Sears, who's the executive director. I mean, that place has done enormous work. They have sponsored, like, the, re the, the policy brief that you and Stuart Beagle did on, you know, how to deal with, with gay teenagers and how to have how to have safe space in schools. Right. It was all about safety in schools. It turned out to be, of course, incredibly timely. We went to D.C. to present this paper to the National Education Association, and it was just days after the suicide at Rutgers, which was only one of five suicides that week. That's right. um, and it's this whole issue of bullying now. It, it's almost like it has to numerically catch the attention of a country. And well, I think that that's what's happening with these cases. Because here's my question to you. Why does the Supreme Court or district courts, the California Supreme Court, who made an, an, an incredible decision about our marriages being, uh, have to be allowed before right, property. in 2008, yeah. Why now? How does this happen that the court does not see us as part of the Constitution, and then the court does. I mean, people feel a little ootsy about it because it's sort of like suddenly the court <laughs> changed its mind about something, and it feels very political to people, but not to me. And I wonder what your opinion is of this well, change. You know it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, think about what, think about what had to lead up to that. You had to have 100 years of... Of the, uh, as we said, the Constitution not recognizing that women were people, and then finally in 1971 saying, oh, right, I guess it does apply to you too. Um, you know, 100 years after the 14th Amendment was enacted. Mm -hmm. And then you've got another 50 years before you get, uh, before you sort of finally start thinking, well, you've got the Stonewall riots, you've got, you've got people, you've got the coming out movement. I mean, coming out has been the single most effective way of breaking down homophobia and, and you know, gay and, and lesbian hatred um, than anything you can imagine. Because suddenly you find out, through coming out, through the whole process of coming out, you find out that your, you know, your kids or your, or your, your uncle, your, your, one of your teachers, your football coaches, your heroes, 
your uh, movie stars, uh, your musicians, uh, your classmates, you, you know, are in fact gay, lesbian, transgender, who knew, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that whole process of coming out, I mean, it's gotten to the point now where um, there was a country and western star who, who made a big deal of coming out and the, and the paper said, ah, you know, been there, we've heard all that, right? <laughs> Everybody's out now. Well, it's not true, obviously. Yeah, maybe on the, on, the, on the thin slices of the east and west coast, there's a huge part of the country there where that process still needs to happen. Mm -hmm. But think about how long that's gone on. Think about how long the show's been on, right? A show like this. Mm -hmm. And then you start seeing things like Will and Grace, right? Which let people, uh, straight people, think that, oh, well, I wouldn't mind having a neighbor like that. You know, that's a, that's, he's a, he seems like a decent guy. <laughs> but, how, but how does that affect the courts? I mean, I do, I guess I want to get at this notion, and I really don't have the vaguest idea what you're going to say about it, but <laughs> this notion that the courts are political. And so now you have a political movement, and so they quickly just change their minds and suddenly discover mm. we're in the Constitution. It seems to me what happens is, it's like a veil is lifted from people's eyes or from the court where every single one of them this year has essentially said these laws are unconstitutional. Why? Because even though the government may distinguish between categories of people, they need a reason. They need a good reason. They need a, <laughs> at least a, a rational reason, or in some cases, not wholly irrational. Remember those cases? <laughs> that's right. Um, that's sort of the lowest but standard. They, and they no. doesn't even meet that standard. And they can't any it's longer. It's not good enough to say, it's not a reason to say, yeah, but these people we, are yucky. Right? <laughs> or we've always done it this way. Right. We've always done it And this that way. has been one of the arguments. Right. Marriage has always been between a man and a woman, and therefore, it must be constitutional to bar marriage by anybody else. Well, and the court finally said, no. You know, I, it's, see, that's the way education works, though, right? Uh -huh. I mean, this is why, and, and you've been in that setting, too, of teaching law as well as using law as well as using, you know, the political process, that the way education works is the first time you hear a theory it's very odd and you don't, and, and all the evidence that might support that theory is, is filtered out. But the more evidence you have, you start thinking, well, my theory doesn't fit that evidence. Mm -hmm. You know, I see these couples and they look like, like, they're, like they're in love and they've been together for 20 years and, or they've raised kids and the kids seem to have turned out all right. We have a 24 year study of lesbian families kids raised in lesbian families, and we find out that there, on most things, there's no difference between the kids raised by lesbians and the kids raised by, by other sex couples. And on a couple categories, the kids of lesbians do a little better. <laughs> um, I mean, the kids are all right? <laughs> the kids are all right, right. You find that out, you know, 24. Well, these people, how can I, how can I maintain my theory that these people are something alien to me, that they're not like, they're not people, when I see this, when I see this evidence. That's how all theories change. That's how all progress is made in the education, in the sciences, and in the courts. So the fact that you've got political movements that are doing this educating doesn't mean it's any different than any other kind of educational process. We are still learning all our lives as people and as a country. So what are you learning, Chris? With I... five minutes remaining in the show, <laughs> I want to bring it back to you, because I think it's also uh, the value of a life, a life so devoted to justice and, and ongoing. I mean, the, the new job, fabulous. Oh, yeah. What are you still learning, Chris? I am, I am learning every single day that, um, that people who care can make an enormous difference. Uh, I have, you know, my colleagues have just been so fabulous in helping me try to figure out how to make this transition. Uh, my students want to do good in the world. I mean, they don't want to just make money. They want to do something 
important to make the world a better place. And when we get together and do it, we can actually save. You know, um, the Bodhisattva vow is sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them all. Mm -hmm. That's a goal that all of us can aspire to. Not so, reach, but aspire to. So how are you doing at reaching your goals? I am so far from saving <laughs> all of them. <laughs> but it doesn't matter because as a little kid who uh, threw the starfish back in when he was told it was useless because there's so many dead starfish, he said, it makes a difference to this one. I think I heard that story from you first time. I'm not sure, but it's a very good story. And if you did, I'm going to use it again, having forgotten it. You know, this is what good friends are for, of you betcha. course. So of all the things that you've done, of all the various jobs that you've done or cases you've been on or people you've taught, what, what are you most proud of? Or two things if you can't choose. <laughs> Oh, there's so much. Well, I am, I probably the thing I'm most proud of is that there is a fully functioning and high status and high stature and high quality Department of Women's Studies at UCLA. Not just because of me, but because enough people came together to make it happen. I'm incredibly proud of the California Women's Law Center that you and I helped found um, that did so much terrific work it has done so much terrific work. And, uh, and I'm still really proud of the, uh, the, the, uh, the Supreme Court opinion uh, when Justice Thurgood Marshall said, you know, uh, it should be, we should, that it's okay to try to make some equality between working dads and working moms um, and not take away the jobs of working moms just because they become moms. I mean, among all those things, it's pretty darn hard to pick. So one more thing you'd like to do, or two, or three? In, in, in my whole lifetime? In your whole lifetime. I would like within the next three years to make a really serious difference in the, in the, in the diversity across the entire campus. And particularly you know, number of women in the hard sciences and in um, you know, places like engineering. Um, and Because I think all of the research indicates that if you have racial, gender, um, and other kinds of diversity, you get better quality. And that research is wonderful, and I want to just spread it far and wide, that there's no conflict, not only is there no conflict between diversity and excellence, you don't get excellence without diversity. Chris, thank you so much for being with <laughs> us. Really wonderful to get to talk to you, totally selfish when I do this show and just pick people that I really admire and like to talk to for an hour. And I hope that you enjoyed it as well. Remember, one person can make a big difference, so get used to it.